are now going to have a conversation starter um, from a very interesting professor from Harvard who um, his whole focus is on healthy buildings and introducing new indicators and vocabulary. His name is Professor Dr. Joseph um, Allen. He's offering a whole new language for healthy buildings. Please give him a warm welcome. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm excited because we had <clears throat> a great conversation at lunch at the Healthy Buildings table, and I'm gonna try and bring some of that into the conversation right now. So my colleague in the audience, Eileen McNeely, somewhere, she likes to talk about the four Ps, people, place, planet, and products. I'm gonna be talking about place. And in my research, do research on healthy buildings, trying to link buildings, building systems, material selection, and how those are gonna influence indoor environmental quality, because ultimately what we care about is how that indoor environmental quality is gonna impact human health, okay? So we'll start with a question. Why are we ignoring the 90%? This is what I mean by this. We spend 90% of our time indoors. Think about how much time we've spent indoors today. Might be more than that, right? But what are we really good at? We're good at measuring and talking about the 10% of outdoor environmental health issues. I bet if I polled the room and asked people about their understanding of particulate matter, air pollution, and its effects on health, greenhouse gases, almost everyone will have this knowledge. But I wonder how many of us feel comfortable talking about and thinking about indoor environmental quality. How many people know that the chairs you're sitting on have flame retardants in them that interfere with our thyroids? thyroid hormone. How many people know that the polyfluorinated compounds that are in the carpets, probably in our, my, my clothes, that make them stain resistant, are obesogens? Probably a smaller number of us feel comfortable thinking about the 90% of where we spend our time. <clears throat> the other 90% that we're ignoring is that the cost of businesses is largely driven by the people inside of our buildings. 90% of the cost. Here again, what are we really good at? We're good at measuring water and energy usage, but we're not good at measuring um, health of the people inside of our buildings. And I think we're not good at because we don't, it's easy to measure things like water usage and energy usage. It's harder to measure things like health and well being that may be a little less tangible. <clears throat> so that's where we are today. One of the key drivers of indoor environmental quality <clears throat> is ventilation. This is a graph showing a 100-year history of ventilation in US homes. Same story for commercial buildings. Largely, this is international. In general, we see about one air change per hour. And that means the amount of air in this space gets exchanged with fresh air once every hour. There's a turnover every hour. There's a big drop off <laughs> starting in about the 1980s in the United States the energy crisis of the late 70s. We started tightening up our building envelopes, and we were down to about, on average, in homes, about half an air change per hour. I've done measurements in new condos, new spaces, you can be down to 0 0.2, 0 0.1 air changes per hour. A lot less fresh air. The big driver of this is an ASHRAE standard, and its name is, is the, the standard for acceptable indoor air quality. Right, it's not the, the standard for good air quality, it's not the standard for optimal air quality, it's the standard for acceptable air quality, and that's it. So it was about this time, in the early 80s, we first saw this term being introduced called sick building syndrome. Related to tightening of the building envelope, bringing in less fresh air, we, by doing that, we increase the uh, concentration of indoor pollutants. But what we're seeing now is a shift, and we've heard a lot of this from other panelists, is that it's no longer acceptable to be in a building that makes us not sick. People are looking to be in buildings that make us healthy. It's a subtle shift, but it's a big one, and it's changing. <clears throat> so what about green buildings? Because by definition, green buildings are designed to be energy efficient, which means they'll have a tighter envelope. They reduce environmental impacts, they conserve water. 
but probably less well known is that green buildings also by definition are designed to have better indoor environmental quality. So we did a review this past summer looking at not the evidence around green buildings and energy, which is well established, energy savings and water conservation, but what about green buildings and health specifically? So we published this paper in um, July. It's open access, freely available. And I'll share some of the key findings. So there's not much done related to green buildings and health. So the first set of studies simply ask occupants about their experience in green buildings. <clears throat> and we see some trends. In general, a lot of studies show that occupants perceive and report better indoor air quality in green buildings. A second set of studies that looked, had um, asked people how they feel in green buildings, but then also took objective measurements of indoor environmental quality. And again, we see, in general, improved indoor environmental quality performance in green buildings, separate from the benefits you get on the environmental side. And last, there was one study that actually used an objective measure of health. This is a study done in a hospital, pre and post, before it transitioned from a conventional hospital to a green hospital. And what they found were some pretty interesting results. They found greater employee satisfaction in the, um, in the green building, greater quality of care, and really interesting, a decrease in patient mortality after controlling for other factors, just related to the built environment itself. There's very few studies on green buildings and health, and all of them have important limitations. Most of them a small sample size, one or two buildings they look at. The other one is that they nearly all rely on subjective measures of outcomes. So you ask people, how are you feeling in this space? I feel great. What do you think of the indoor quality? It feels great. The problem there from an epidemiological study design is you create this thing called dependent error, where you have stoics and complainers. How are you feeling? It's terrible in here. I feel terrible. I have a bad headache. It's great. It, the air is great in here. I feel great. It can lead to these false associations. <clears throat> so a lot of these studies suffer from uh, this limitation. The other lim important limitation is that um, nearly all of the measures are uh, subjective. There's very few objective measurements. And we also have a selection bias problem. That's the Yelp effect. The only people who are going to participate are the people who are really happy or really upset with the space. And we're losing a lot of the nuance of the people who um, are not on those extremes. So I'll introduce the study that um, we just published two weeks ago. You're, you're some of the first people to hear about it here presented. It was published in Environmental Health Perspectives. It's getting a lot of attention. We're excited because in public health, this doesn't always happen, especially if you're talking about indoor environmental quality. This rarely ever happens. But um, it's been in the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg. We were on NPR. And uh, we started to look at objective measures of decision-making performance or cognitive function when you compare people when they spend time in a conventional space versus one that's optimized for health. <clears throat> so here's the study design. <clears throat> it's different from a typical, typical public health study. We actually enrolled office workers to come into the Syracuse Center of Excellence, this is depicted on the top right, to do their normal work routine over two weeks. So they did their normal work in the simulated office environment. And unbeknownst to them, each day from the floor below, that's depicted on the bottom right, we were able to change and modify the indoor environment, controlling all of the variables and modifying one variable at a time. <clears throat> So they do the normal work routine. We change the environment each day. At the end of the day, we administer a cognitive function test. And the test is designed to simulate real world decision making performance, right? How we all operate every day in an office environment. We have access to unlimited information with the internet. Our phone's ringing, text messages coming in, emails coming in. We have colleagues coming in with questions. We're trying to focus on a task at hand while thinking about the task for tomorrow, while making plans and strategies for next month, next year, five years out. Inevitably, during our days, crises happen, big crises, little crises, and you have to deal with them. Well, this tool we use has been tested on over 70,000 people, and it simulates these kind of decision-making and, and, um, and thought process. So in one scenario, you might be a, um, 
a mayor of a city, and you are presented with a series of events that are happening in your city, and you have access to all the information a mayor would have. And we track how you plan and take actions and the strategies you use to, um, uh, to address crises that happen. And then we also try to understand how you recover. What's your resilience? How do you recover after a crisis? Are you done for the day? Or do you go back to your planning and strategic thinking? So that's a little bit of the tool. The three variables we tested, we isolated. One was the amount of outdoor air ventilation we get. So we looked at what happens if you double the amount from that acceptable air quality to one that's actually optimized for health. We looked at the impact of carbon dioxide, independent of ventilation. And third, we looked at the, the impact of volatile organic compounds. These are chemicals that we're exposed to all day, everywhere. They off-gas from uh, carpets, personal care products, building materials. That's the new car smell, is VOCs. So we isolated those variables in our design, controlling for everything else. The study's a double-blinded study. Participants don't know what's happening each day. The analysts who analyzed the cognitive function data were not privy to the scenarios that were tested. So it's double-blinded. And I'll share what we found. So the results are striking. We found a doubling of cognitive function scores for people who spent time in green buildings with enhanced ventilation versus those same people when they spent time in an environment designed to simulate a conventional building. So simply modifying a few variables, we showed a doubling of cognitive function scores in these environments. It's important to, to say that we didn't test any extremes here either. The ventilation rates are all attainable. The chemicals we introduced are common chemicals from office supply products. So there's nothing really extreme here. The carbon dioxide concentrations we tested are probably the carbon dioxide concentrations in this room. The carbon dioxide concentrations we see in schools and airplanes. So there's nothing exotic in this, in this study design. What's really interesting is that three cognitive function domains had even bigger improvements than a doubling of scores. And this was information usage, crisis response, and strategy. And these cognitive function domains are the ones that are most closely linked with productivity. So these are the results for the nine cognitive function domains for VOCs and ventilation. And now I'll show you the carbon dioxide results. Here's one domain, I'll show you all nine in a second. But we tested carbon dioxide concentrations at around 500 parts per million. Outdoors about 400 for reference, okay, and rising. Then we tested 950 parts per million. That is what you'd expect to find if you're meeting the ASHRAE minimum standard for ventilation. And then we tested 1,400 parts per million. And what we see is that for many of the domains, we see significant decrements in decision-making performance as you increase the carbon dioxide concentration. So this should be sh shocking because for decades, we've thought carbon dioxide is benign at these concentrations. It's useful as an indicator of how well we're ventilating a space. But this and one other study are starting to show that carbon dioxide has uh, maybe a direct pollutant that's impacting our cognitive function. So in the last two minutes, I'm going to get to the conversation starter. We've been thinking a lot, well, you're, many of you are business owners, and you have KPIs. So businesses track key performance indicators. They're interested in profit at the end of the year, but they'd be foolish if they weren't tracking metrics on an hourly basis, weekly, monthly, to see how they're performing throughout the year. In health, we don't really do the same thing. So we want to change the talk around KPIs to HPIs, health performance indicators. So what are the health performance indicators of businesses that will let us know how we're doing for the metric that really matters the most? And this is the framework that we've been using, similar to what businesses do. We divided it into those HPIs, the health performance indicators that are lagging and leading, and those that are direct and indirect measures of health. And we played this game with, um, <clears throat> with colleagues and students. So I do this in class to say, well, let's start populating this box. So this is just some examples, it's really endless what you could do. So if you think about direct but lagging indicators of health, 
Maybe for schools, you would measure absenteeism or test scores or asthma. We measured cognitive function. The bottom left, if we think about lagging but indirect measures, if we look at that subset box, we take measurements of indoor air quality. It's going to be an indicator of health. It's a lagging indicator because you take a measurement, send it to a lab. A month later, you get the results and you know something. But it's too late to intervene. <clears throat> so on the bottom right, we have some other indirect indicators of health, but they're leading. So you could think about green building design credits. We know that if you build to green standards, you're going to have better improved indoor environmental quality. So it's an indirect indicator, a leading indicator of how well your space is going to perform. And where our industry is moving is this top right piece. I started a group at Harvard called Harvard Sensors for Health. We want to take advantage of mHealth mobile sensors so that we can make, we can track physiological responses in relation to the built environment and make interventions in real time. So direct indicators of health, leading indicators of health that can lead to timely interventions. And we're already doing this. We measure people's um, uh, heart rate and skin temperature and have linked watch-based sensors with the uh, mechanical systems for space. We do this, we've done this in a study this summer. So that we can modify in real time, autonomously, the indoor environment based on how people are actually responding in that space. So that's where we're going. So here's the conversation starter. Think about health performance indicators. Think about why we're ignoring the 90%. And if you're given the job of, um, if you're responsible for health in the company, what are the health performance indicators you'd want to track through all of these domains? What are the leading and lagging and direct and indirect health performance indicators to track how well a company is doing in regards to health and well-being? So thank you. Thank you.